Welcome to the Mom Owned and Operated Podcast, the podcast about moms and for moms, where we have candid conversations about running a business, raising a family, and remembering ourselves. I'm your host, Rita Suzanne, a single mom of four, digital strategist, and provider of no-nonsense business strategies and tactics. Hi, this is Mom Owned and Operated. I'm Rita Suzanne, and today I have my guest, Danielle, with me. Danielle, I'm so excited to chat with you today. Please tell everyone all about you, your business, and your family. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yes, I'm officially Dr. Danielle Angela. I know my last name is kind of unusual, but it was my middle name at birth, which I, after my second divorce, transitioned to my legal last name. The legal process is still in process. Um, I am the mom of three kids. They are 13. My middle child is just three days away from her 10th birthday, and my youngest is six. So they're kind of a variety of ages. I also have a stepdaughter from my second marriage who's now 21, and she lives on her own, of course. And <laughs> um, we stay in contact, even though her dad are, her dad and I are not together anymore. Um yeah, so that's kind of a bit about my family. I have a significant other who also has three kids. So one day we anticipate being married and being, um, you know, step step parents to each other's children officially, which means I'll have a total of seven children at that time. You like a Brady <laughs> bunch almost, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven, seven definitely feels like a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, a lot. Um, a little bit about my professional backgrounds. I am a a chiropractor by um, training and credentials. I graduated from chiropractic school in 2008. And in sort of an odd path, I took after school, um, I applied for a residency position that was available at the school that I had graduated from. So I began working alongside my chiropractic professors a week after I graduated talk about imposter syndrome. It was so uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, But I really loved my job. I was really fortunate to be able to have the position that I did and to even just have a steady salary at that time, because the majority of chiropractors leave chiropractic school and they go off to start their own business, which as you know, as most of us know here, starting your own business doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting paid from your own business, especially in the beginning. So I was very fortunate to have that role. And I did a lot of things in my position at the university. One of those was helping students to start to think about their own business and what their branding and their marketing would look like. I had no branding and marketing experience, really. Um, I just, I guess I just kind of had like a knack for it. I don't even know. It just happened. So I've advised and helped hundreds, if not thousands of chiropractors now on starting their business, looking at associate contracts, lease agreements, um, independent contractorships, choosing their logo, their fonts, their brand colors, their naming their business, all of those things. In 2015, it's kind of a weird, <laughs> it's weird to tell you, like, when did I start my coaching practice? Because I really started trying to get it started in 2014 I think I made a little bit of money in 2015 and I made a little bit more in 2016. It wasn't really until 2017 that I made a significant amount of money, which was roughly $50,000. So Mm -hmm. take that for what you will. I was kind of starting a business in 2014, but I wasn't making money until 2016 at all. Um, So that being said, I've been I've been coaching in my own business now for eight years. And throughout the beginning few years, I really focused specifically on female chiropractors. And that was, you know, that was my background. Eventually there became a lot of other options for um, female uh, chiropractors in regard to coaches. At the time that I started, I was one of the very, very few, very few female chiropractors who were coaching. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) um, as, as like other people came on the scene, I got kind of bored, frankly. I was like, well, this, this was really cool. Whenever I was like one of the very few people doing this, I had started the very first podcast for female chiropractors. And then when there were others, I was like, "Eh, I just don't feel that inspired anymore. Right. (laughs) 
<laughs> so it was something I really had to wrestle with because, you know, of course, most people would be like, oh, you're just afraid of the competition. It really didn't feel like that to me. I was just like, mm, I just don't, I just don't feel like this is as fun and inspiring anymore as it used to be. So I started to kind of diversify my business and pivot, if you will. Although the pivot has felt like a never ending pivot for the last essentially four years, really. 2020 happened and all of my customers were brick and mortar business owners. Mm -hmm. And that was a very stressful year. It was a very difficult time because they were used to coming to me for support and advice on what to do in their business. And I was making it up as we were going. Literally, right. no one knew what we were doing. Some states, the uh, chiropractors had to close. In other states, chiropractors got to stay open. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> right. right. It was a lot. And I had already been feeling called to doing other things. So long story short, now after the last four years of transition, getting divorced, moving to a new home, a new city, all of the things, I have refined my coaching practice so that I'm helping service providers charge their worth. Mm -hmm. And which is such a, I think, a struggle having started as a primarily a service um, provider myself. Yes. I, I remember when I started, I started in 2014. Um, and I knew because when I started, before I started, I was driving to work every single day with my corporate job. And I was listening to podcasts and reading blogs and just based on doing so much research and having my notebook and like doing all of the things and seeing a couple clients while I was still working in corporate um, as a web designer, I knew when I finally took the leap that I was not going to start. I was not going to start out ch undercharging, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I came in probably charging way, probably middle tier for someone who was brand new. Um, like even in today's market, I probably was charging way more. So I was charging $2,000 to start at a brand new for a website. And back then, we're talking 10 years ago, back then, everybody else was probably starting at around 800, especially if you were new, they were starting at six to 800. And I was just like, well, if, you know, in my mind, I said, this is just, I can't, I can't do it because it's so time and labor intensive. Yes. So I couldn't do it. So um, I get that. And I wish more women were, were like, would start there. But why do you feel that they start themselves at a, I guess, at such a low price initially, like right out of the gate? Well, that's an interesting question. There's a few things that come to my mind. One is that in the health and wellness industry, there's this kind of expectation that you practice the modality that you practice because you want to help people and that it's not about the money. Mm -hmm. And people hear that from clients often and then let that mean that they shouldn't make their business about the money yet you run a business with the intention of making money. So it sets us up for this like swirly mix of emotions and um, energetic funk really around trying to run a profitable business without appearing to be about money. Right. Uh, the notion again, you know, that health and wellness practitioners should just like do what they do out of the kindness of their heart is not a sustainable business model. Um, yet in professions like chiropractic and acupuncture, and this applies to many others, but I can speak to those two from firsthand experience. The, primary or like loudest model of success is a high volume model. So what that means for us is that we see a lot of patients really like as many as possible, but that we're cheap and affordable. Right. And that's a really fast path to burning out. In mm -hmm. fact, the burnout rate for female chiropractors is really high. There was apparently, it's kind of been buried. There was apparently one study that was conducted from one chiropractic school in particular, this was 2017 or 18, that indicated 80% of their female graduates were no longer practicing five years after graduation. Mm -hmm. 
And that's not good because chiropractors take on a lot of student loan debt to finance their education. And we're talking like $250,000 and you Mm -hmm. don't have that paid off. In fact, you've probably, your balance has only increased in those first five years of practice because you're not making enough money to be paying your $2,000, $3,000 student loan payment each month. So, so the balance the of mm-hmm. your loans, and then you leave the profession. Again, not <laughs> something that really motivates people to go to chiropractic school, right? So nobody wants to talk about that. But that's just within the chiropractic profession. That is something that we see also in um, education. Lots mm-hmm. and lots of burnout in education, right? Because being a service provider is hard. Yeah. It's well, hard. even like our online entrepreneurs, like they're like that. And he, I, I find a lot of women entrepreneurs in general will undercharge. And then because they don't really, I don't really know like how to word it exactly, but they don't want to overcharge because of the fear that they're not really worth that amount, right? Especially when they're comparing themselves to other people who maybe seem like they're doing better, but that's just like the facade of social media. Totally, yes. So that's one of the other factors, right? In regard to setting our fees, maybe at where other people in our industry are at or even below where they are at so that, it's an easy yes. When you tell your fees to a potential new client, they're like, oh, you're cheaper than the other person. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily set someone up for success as a client or a patient or customer. We hope that it does, but it, it doesn't necessarily create an environment where they're invested in what they're receiving from you and the work that they're doing with you. And it's cheap. So, hey, if it doesn't work, not a big deal. Yeah. Often I find, I have found that the clients who haven't really paid as much are the hardest clients to work with. So, um, and they want the most and they burn you out the fastest. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it would be better if service providers knew how to charge their worth. So, um, what do you, do you, have any recommendations on how someone would be able to like figure out their value versus just making a list and comparing themselves to everyone else in their market? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, let's start with what not to do, right? Don't compare your fees. You might look at what other people are charging in your market or in your industry. Sure. As sort of a baseline, Mm-hmm. But I don't recommend using that as a like a metric to really decide what your fees are because you might have children and they don't, they might have all day to work or love working all day. They might have a constitution that just allows them to have a really long work day and work five or six or seven days a week. Well, yours may not be like that. There's a lot of variables, right? Mm -hmm. For me, every time I had another child, I was like, my fees have to increase now. My time has become so much more valuable because I now have another child I need to give my time and energy and attention to. So that means I need to see fewer clients and be more available for my kids. But in order to make the income that I want to make, I need to increase my fees. So I just Mm -hmm. did that every time that I had um, every time I had another baby (laughs) and I've done it several times since, you know, because my youngest is six years old. Um, so we don't want to compare and set our fees based upon what other people are doing. You don't know if they're profitable. Mm -hmm. That's true. And really like what they're offering in that service, right? Like what they're actually delivering could not even be comparable to what you're offering. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I always have told my clients from day one to really keep your eyes on your own paper. Like I always do this and, and I say, yes, do a little bit of competitor, like market research. But once you do that, really don't 
don't indulge in it because what I find happens is the they're over there like, oh, this person has this new offer. Now I have to create a new offer. This person has this new shiny thing. Now I have to do this thing. And yeah. then they're constantly trying to keep pace with everyone else instead of focusing on what they're best at. And then they're not able to really shine. And then they become burnt out a lot faster, right? Because they're, again, trying to keep pace with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Or increase their income by squeezing more clients into their schedule, which is, again, it's just exhausting. So what do we want to do instead? We want to start with what is the income that you would actually want to be earning? What does it cost to cover your expenses, both personally and in your business? If you're a solo Mm -hmm. practitioner, it's generally pretty easy to figure out. From there, how much time do you actually have available to be in direct service to your customers? Mm -hmm. But I want you to also account for the things that you need and want to be doing for yourself to replenish yourself so that you don't find yourself in that place of feeling like, well, I took on all these clients and now I have no time to do what I need to be doing to recharge myself to be available to all these clients. It's a slippery slope. So really make sure that you've accounted for how much time you want to spend with your family. How much time do you want to spend, whether it's going to the gym or going for walks or cooking healthy food at home? We forget that we get to do these things as business owners. One of the main reasons we chose to be a business owner is for the freedom that can come along with it, the time freedom. Right. Mm-hmm. So account for all those things before you decide how much time do you really have available to be in direct service to your clients. And also remember that you've got to do the other things to grow the business and build awareness, brand awareness and <laughs> marketing and all the things. Right. Mm-hmm. Plus, not to mention completing your tax return and staying on top of your monthly bookkeeping. All of it all needs of to be accounted things. for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Suddenly you find that you have a lot less time than what you think that you do to be working in your business. Mm -hmm. So we can just kind of take the math and reverse engineer it, right? Start with what you really truly want to be earning and how much time do you have available to earn that amount of money? And I have a worksheet that helps people go through this. It's really like when you see it, if you're a visual person like I am, it's really quick and easy to do. And it's very eye opening especially for service providers who have been doing what we've just said not to do. They've been basing their fees on like what's usual in their industry or what are their competitors mm-hmm. charging? Yeah, They start to realize really quickly why they feel so overwhelmed. Right. And, and that, I think that's the biggest cause. I think that, um, you know, burnout is just so serious, especially for moms, right? Because you, you know, like your health is just so important and we just will sacrifice everything sometimes Mm -hmm. and it's just not worth it. And so like really figuring out charging your worth is like something that people say all the time, but I don't think that it's something that people actually implement and do. And especially when you're in those periods of downtime, they get really scared, right? The money mindset starts to kick in and they they just really don't know what to do. So I think using a worksheet like yours can help them to see in a more like logical way of where, you know, what actual time that they have available. And I've fallen into like this in the past, not necessarily with uh, services, but with scheduling my podcast, right? So I've done where I've, said, you know, like, um, I'm back with my podcast and then I'll like schedule, 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 schedule. And then I will do the calls, but I would get so overwhelmed that I wasn't, um, posting all of them or, you know, I would get so much and I was just like, I just can't do this because I would burn myself out from all of the time that I was spending on all of the calls. And, um, so I learned my lesson. I was like, I can't do this. I have to actually like interview and then share interview and share interview and share. And so, um, you know, to make it actually worth it versus, you know, trying to, I guess, like bundle it up or like hold on to them in some way. So I, I feel like you, you kind of figure it out and, you know, find what works best for you. But a lot of times, like only after you've burnt out. Right. Like only after we have hit some kind of rock bottom in a sense, do we then know, okay, what actually 
what is it that I actually do want and what's not working? What do I want instead? I was yeah. just talking with someone else about that this morning, you know, from like the chiropractic lens of, mm-hmm. you know, treating patients that come with chronic back pain or migraines, whatever it might be, they generally don't show up until they're hurting. And they've been hurting in some cases for a long time. In the ideal scenario, they'd be coming to us before they're in a situation where they've been having migraines every day for three months or three years or 30 years sometimes. But that's not like what motivates us. We're not motivated by prevention. We're motivated by resolving a pain or a problem. Right. So yeah, if you, if, if someone that's listening finds themselves, you know, identifying with like feeling burned out, feeling constantly overwhelmed, just know that it's okay. It doesn't mean that you're, you're broken or you're doing something wrong. It's just kind of a process that we all go through. And even, you know, in the past when I've considered myself an expert in quotes of like productivity and time management, there have been multiple phases of my life where I've felt like, I'm out of balance or I need to make the changes I teach other people how to make so that I'm able to continue to do what I'm doing for the long term. And you know that, Rita, because I had just shared with you last week, like I'm in this whole new phase of trying to figure out how to balance my time with my children when they're only with me 50% of the time. Yeah, it's really tough. I, um, had an interview with somebody earlier and I shared this analogy and I'm going to share it again because I think that it actually fits here as well as well and I think that um it's it's an important one and so have you heard the analogy of the cow and the lion I don't think so So it goes into a lot of the hustle culture that a lot of women um, entrepreneurs especially feed into. And, um, and so the analogy is similar to like the way that the cows seek after their food is they're constantly grazing, right? And that's the, um, if you will, the hustle mentality, you're constantly graze, 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 graze. And so the, objective is actually to be more like the lion, right? To where you actually are resting. That's what the lion does. The lion is not constantly walking around, looking for prey, looking to see what they're going to do. They're resting. They're in waiting, right? They're, they're in, they're in lying in wait. And then when they see their prey, that's when they expend the energy and they go after their prey. And so, um, I feel like that's what more women need to actually do is to actually be the lion instead of the cow, right? Because then you get the break. You're lying in wait, you're resting, your brain is going to be time to, to recoup, your body has time to recoup, and now you can be ready when it's time to go, you're ready versus yes. the cow who's constantly just expending that energy, just, you know, so... There's a great book on this subject called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. The -hmm. title might seem a little bit off topic, but it's really about the same kind of principle that we need a lot more rest than what we think that we do. Mm -hmm. And don't, we have, especially in today's society now more than ever, we have things that are constantly in front of us. Like we always have a stressor in front of us if we allow that to happen. Yeah. We're not designed or we haven't evolved to catch up to that lifestyle yet. And it affects our nervous system, our endocrine system, and eventually causes chronic health issues of all kinds. And we wonder why we're so sick as a society, but we're not addressing the root cause that we're not truly giving ourselves enough rest. We can do all of the other things, but rest is such a huge part of the equation. And it's probably the hardest thing for us to allow ourselves to do. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers is a really, really good book for anyone that needs more of like the the technical aspects of why you need more rest than you think that you do. 
which I think is important because like we've been as, especially as moms, like we're trained to just be on the go, right? Like we're on the go for our kids, for our partner, for our business, you know, especially as business owners. And then finally, hopefully a little bit for ourselves. And it's like, go, 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 go. And we don't have that time to rest and recoup. And that's what results in the burnout. Yeah. Totally. In addition to working extra hard and getting underpaid. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So really it brings the conversation full circle because when you're charging more than maybe what you think that you should be initially, at least it allows you to have a lighter client schedule or client load, which also then again, creates more time, allows more time for you to be able to rest or just like go at a slower pace. And It's kind of counterculture to approach business that way because also also culture is like as many people as possible, right? Mm -hmm. But this is a different approach. It's like, actually, I'll take fewer people, but earn more per client or customer or patient and let that be okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that if we did that, then it would be easier and and just realize that maybe your pricing isn't the, the right price for everyone, but there are clients that are willing to pay them and you just have to connect with them. And and you, once you do, then, yeah. you know, you'll you'll have clients. You yeah. just got to find them. Exactly. Yeah. When I started coaching in my own business back in 2000. 17 was really when I was like offering coaching packages. Um, I think I was charging like $3,000 for six months. And that was like 12 sessions Mm -hmm. in six months of time. Now I charge five times that much. I charge $15,000 for six months of working with me Mm one-to-one. I would have never thought that I could do that. I would have never thought back in 2017 that I could have a conversation with a potential new client and tell them my fees were (laughs) $15,000 to work with me for six months. But I just kept incrementally increasing my fees as I developed more confidence in my skill set and also saw the results that my clients were getting. And Mm -hmm. what's also happened is that in 2017, 18, 19, even as recently as 2022, I had like 24 clients that I was working with at a time. And that's a lot. But my brain was so conditioned to see it as like just normal to fill my schedule with people Mm -hmm. that I just kept pushing myself to do it. And Mm -hmm. it was over the last couple of years that I was like, this is not how I want to do this anymore. I didn't even feel like I was offering the best service to my clients when I was like moving from one session to the next session, to the next session, to the next session, to the next session, you know, six straight hours. Right. Your brain is just like tired. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just share that as an example, you know, that like what you, where you think you are right now and what you think might be possible for you are two different things. I didn't think that I would ever be able to charge the fees that I charge now. I just thought that that was crazy. Right. And and I think that, yeah, I think it's important to realize that you can charge whatever you want, right? It's your business. You have the freedom to make it however you want. You yeah. just have to position it in the way that works for you. Yes. That's, yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. So let's move on and let's talk about, um, so something I've recently been adding on and kind of talking more about is what tools, it could be an app, it could be software, it could be something, anything that you're using in your business that is kind of helping you streamline, optimize, function better. Like what can you recommend to the audience that you're loving right now? I really love Stripe. And it's, to me, it's more than just a payment processor. I've been using Stripe since 2016. And frankly, there was a time period in 2021 where at the advice of my bookkeeper at that time, I moved to a different payment processor platform and it was a disaster. Mm. It was, yes, potentially going to save us some money in credit card processing fees, but it cost me an arm and a leg (laughs) and a team member, right? Because I was having my assistant at that time, like work through all these issues that were coming up with this new payment processor that frankly just wasn't 
equipped to handle business the way that we did it. I had a membership program that had lots of payments coming in every month, as mm. well as I had a launch of a course and we collected, uh, I think it was around $83,000 one month. And they mm. were like, is this legit? Like last month you collected, tw- I think it was like 20, 25,000. I'm like, yeah, we just had a course launch. This is just like the normal course of business for us. But they withheld funds for three weeks because oh they wanted to, to make sure it. we weren't going to have like chargebacks or there wasn't some kind of some kind of fraud that had happened from our business. That did not feel good. And I had never had any kind of issue like that happen with Stripe. But one of the reasons um, that I still really like Stripe now is even as a solo entrepreneur right now for the last year, I've not had any team members. I find it really easy to just be able to like have a conversation with someone and create a custom package for them and then go to Stripe, create a link, and then just send that link to the new client and Mm -hmm. they can, it's like so easy. Yeah. I use Stripe too. And I've been using it for like um, custom payment things, like really simple um, payments, but it's also connected to my QuickBooks for like my regular invoicing and all of that stuff. So um, I use it and then I use uh, Zapier to automate like any transactions that I get inside of Stripe, they automatically go into QuickBooks for me so that I don't have to manually do them. So that's a little little like automation bonus for you. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So let's also talk about, we, you already gave us the uh, zebra book, but let's talk about <laughs> what are you reading or listening to now that, and it doesn't have to be a business thing, but um, what are you listening to or reading now? Um, I'm currently just starting a book called creating a life that matters. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm so early into it that I'm not quite sure yet if I love it or not. Um, over the last several months, though, I've been I've been learning a lot about uh, relationships and attachment styles from a few different podcasts and YouTube channels. And I think this is a topic that everyone should know about. And I'm really shocked at how I got to like 43 years old, <laughs> two marriages, and also a degree in social work. My bachelor's degree is in social work and I didn't know about attachment styles. Mm -hmm. It has made a huge difference for me in understanding how I relate to not only my significant other, but also my children too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very interesting. I I've um, seen some stuff on it, but not enough to really speak about it, but it is very interesting um, yeah. to see the the ways. And then you're like, oh, I know somebody just like that, you know, or that's me. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. Um, so um, the last thing is always, I want to always, always, always know about self-care because as you know, and everybody knows, I started this podcast because I wasn't doing a good job at taking care of me. So I love to know um, how you are taking care of you. What are you doing just for you, Daniel? Well, I have things that I do on a consistent basis that are just for me, but they also benefit everyone else around me because I'm better when I do them. I lift weights four times a week. Um, I get a massage at least once a month, ideally twice. That's re- That feels like really indulgent when I do it twice, but I notice a difference um, when I go down to one time a month. I, you know, I read, I take walks. Um, I have certain supplements I take. I see a nutritional response practitioner who has me like um, change my supplement protocol based upon my body's needs at the time. But the thing that is really the most important for me is spending time by myself. That's mm-hmm. where I like really emotionally recharge. And honestly, also over the last year to two years since my second divorce and having children in that divorce was a whole different experience than my first where we didn't have children. Um, spending time alone is also like where I really work through the stuff that I need to heal. (laughs) That doesn't happen um, well when my children are around. And so really prioritizing time that I'm by myself, not time that I'm home alone because I'm working here at Mm -hmm. home, but like truly just doing nothing Mm -hmm. is 
Yeah. So you can reflect and like really just work through some of the issues. Cause I get that, you know, I was, I've been divorced twice and it is, um, it's a, it's a lot. It's a, it's a big process. So, um, where can everyone find you? Where are you at online and where can they grab this, um, worksheet that you have? Yeah. The best places to connect with me are on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Dr. Danielle Angela in both of those places. And then my website is also drdanielleangela.com. If you go to drdanielleangela.com forward slash formula, you'll get the worksheet that I mentioned. And it's a really quick process to just work you through. You might not feel ready to make changes in your fees right away, but that's okay. It at least helps you see what's possible for you. And then you can start working toward those changes in the future. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for being a guest. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been fun. And there you have it. I want to encourage you to remember that being a mom who runs her own business is not easy. We all struggle, but just keep moving forward and don't forget to make time for yourself. As moms, we are usually the first thing to go to the bottom of the list. If your business is overwhelming you and you need real solutions, not just some sugar-coated suggestions, apply to work with me at ritasuzanne.com slash apply.